entrepreneurs was very much an entrepreneur, very outgoing, very flamboyant, and the ultimate promoter. A drinker, a carouser, a playboy, the black sheep of the Penrose family who goes west and as often happens, makes a success of himself. Spencer Penrose is known for always wearing riding outfits. He carried pearl-handled revolvers and rode a white horse. So like so many of these rags to riches prospectors who came to Colorado, he came here with relatively little and ended up making it a gigantic fortune. Colorado Experience is a co-production of Rocky Mountain PBS and History Colorado. History Colorado brings history to life for audiences of all ages. Through exhibits, collections, and historic preservation programs throughout the state, History Colorado connects people to the stories, places, and heritage of Colorado's past that provide perspectives on today and inspire our choices for tomorrow. Find out more at www.historycolorado.org. Additional funding provided by El Pomar Foundation and the Betcher Foundation, celebrating 75 years of philanthropy in Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations, and from viewers like you, thank you. The story starts back in Philadelphia where he was born into a very affluent, prominent family there. He came from a very wealthy and well-connected family. He had a brother who was a senator, another one who was a very famous physician, another one who was a general. And he was a scion of this, this wealthy and influential Philadelphia family. All of his brothers went to Harvard. One of them, a U.S. Senator, Boys Penrose, was prominent in, in selecting Harding president in 1920. Spencer Penrose, like all Penroses, went to Harvard. Uh, he happened to graduate last in his class. Also at Harvard, he uh, did get into rowing. He wasn't real good on academics, but he was big on rowing uh, on the, the, the river there. And one day he accidentally knocked out an eye. He actually had one of his eyes damaged by a polo accident. I think it was in a cranking an automobile with the crank and the crank backfired and he lost his eye so he had a he had a glass eye. And at cocktail parties that was great fun to pop out your eye and show it to people. But he had two glass eyes, one that was clear and one that was bloodshot. He had different glass eyes depending upon his state of mind. So he had bloodshot eyes for mornings and he had clear white eyes for evening. He had no interest in staying in Philadelphia, being part of the family tradition. He started to work his way out west. From what we understand, his father gave him $2,000 and said, spend it and then you'll come back. Well, he ended up in New Mexico on a fruit and vegetable farm. He ended up working in a copper mine in Utah. He even was in a mine in, in Arizona. The irony is some of these mines that he had jobs at, he would ultimately own interests in. Spencer Penrose came to Colorado uh, in the early 1890s, a little bit later than the first wave of, of migrants into Colorado. He came after the great Cripple Creek Gold Strike of 1890, the, the richest gold strike in Colorado's history. About the time he ran out of money, he was visiting with his brother Dick Penrose, and this is the about 1891, and his brother said, by the way, Charlie Tutt, your friend from childhood, is living in Colorado Springs and has a real estate business, and mining has just been discovered in a place called Cripple Creek, and you might want to go up and visit him. His family, after a, a period of time, uh, indicated they simply had had enough of it and they wanted him to come home, and they really weren't going to help him out anymore, and he literally took the last money he had and sunk it into a mining operation uh, in southern Colorado. And the two of them decided to go into the gold mining business together. They formed a partnership, Tut Penrose Real Estate. My great-grandfather loaned him the $500 for the capital, and Mr. Penrose never paid him back.
The timing couldn't have been better because my great-grandfather just bought a mining interest called the COD mine, cash on delivery. It happened to be in an area called Poverty Gulch, and just a few months before, a guy named Bob Womack, a cowboy, had discovered gold in Cripple Creek. And so the ultimate outcome is the COD mine was across the valley from the Womack mine. They worked it for about six months and then sold it for $250,000, which is a lot of money in 1897, to a French syndicate. And from what I understand, filled up with water in a, a wet summer, the next summer, and they were never able to pump the water out and they never got much gold out after that. So it was probably good timing on their part. So they make the first, I think, uh, half million dollar mine sale in Cripple Creek. Then they get into land investments. At one point, they realized the success in mining wasn't finding the gold, but was actually getting it out of Cripple Creek. He not only got into mining, but into smelting. And that huge Colorado City smelter started out as the Philadelphia and Colorado smelter. So basically, if you want to get your gold ore out of Cripple Creek, you had two choices, process with the A.E. Carlton mill in Cripple Creek or Penrose and Tut operation uh, in Colorado Springs, Canyon City, or Florence. But where he really makes his money is he's smart enough to get into copper. They formed the Utah Copper Company in 1904. They bought up all of uh, Bingham Canyon and they started mining the copper ore. So all during the Depression, all during the wars, particularly, he's selling copper and making a fortune. And with that fortune, he builds up Colorado Springs. First thing he does there is build the Broadmoor Hotel in 1918, still one of Colorado's great luxury hotels. If you look back when he built the Broadmoor Hotel, he just didn't want to build another hotel. He had originally tried to acquire the Antlers Hotel from the estate of General Palmer. And unfortunately, uh, General Palmer's legal counsel, a gentleman named Bell, he wanted $250,000 for the Antlers. Mr. Penrose offered him fifty. dollars Ultimately, Mr. Bell came down to $78,000. Mr. Penrose did not budge. So in the end, Mr. Penrose, in a letter, told uh, Mr. Bell that I will not accept your offer and I will build the finest hotel Colorado Springs has ever seen. The Broadmoor Hotel for arguably Colorado's finest hotel and luxurious in every way because Penrose really wanted it to be the best hotel in Colorado. But Mr. Penrose did everything with flamboyance. When he built the Broadmoor Hotel, starting in 1916, finishing it in 1918, he wanted the people on the East Coast and the West Coast to appreciate everything he was doing. So the architects he hired were named Warren and Wetmore. They had just finished Grand Central Station in New York, and they had built the original Biltmore Hotel. So everybody in New York and Philadelphia knew who Warren and Wetmore were. The landscape architect he hired was a firm called Frederick Law Olmsted, who had not many years before had finished a nice park in New York City called Central Park. The artisans who actually painted the ceilings in the main hotel were the same artisans who painted the ceilings in Grand Central Station. So Mr. Penrose wanted everybody who came to Colorado Springs to feel like they were in Philadelphia or New York or San Francisco, but with the beauty of Pikes Peak and Colorado as their backdrop. But he opens this hotel in 1918 in this little town of Colorado Springs and nobody comes. And here you have this huge, grandiose hotel with very few customers. So he starts developing tourist attractions. He buys out the Pikes Peak Cog Railway, beefs that up to give people a right way to get up Pikes Peak. The center of the track is equipped with a cog rail which fits into a driving gear beneath the engine and assures a safe means of locomotion. Also, you could take burrow rides up there. Manitou and his fellow beasts of burden make their living by hauling people over the well-known mountain trails that lead from the summit to various points of interest on Mount Manitou. They have made each trip so often that they know every foot of the way, and when given plenty of rain, will take you there and bring you back without a word from the rider. He owned the Gray Line Tours, he owned the Taxi Cab Company. He pretty much was the primary promoter of Colorado Springs. He had an 
an elephant that served as his caddy on the Broadmoor Golf Course, which was one of the great early golf courses in Colorado, and you could have this elephant serving as your caddy. He used to keep the elephants in the paint barns of the Broadmoor Garage, which is across the street from the hotel. But once one of them broke out and was running down Lake Avenue, and so the neighbors told him he had to move them. And so in the early 20s, he built the Shine Mountain Zoo. Shirley is 14 years old, is seven feet high, and like most women, will not tell her weight. She is the newest arrival at the zoo. When he built the Shy Mountain Zoo in the 1920s, really as a promotion uh, for her hotel guests at the Broadmoor, uh, one of the first elephants he bought, he named Tessie. Tessie happened to be the name of one of the more prominent prostitutes in Cripple Creek. And so we don't have any proof of it, but there is some stories that name was familiar to him. There was even a period where he had seals in the Broadmoor Lake, and then he finally had to get rid of them because they kept poaching food from the hotel guests, and then when the hotel guests would say no, they would just take it from them. And so the guests complained, so the seals had to go to the zoo. And then he had the resources to invite the famous hoteliers from the coast out here for these week-long escapades in the early and mid-20s, promoting the Pikes Peak region as a place for them and their patrons to come to Colorado. A lot of the people who've come to love Colorado and move here for part of the year first came to know about Colorado uh, through visiting the Broadmoor. Prohibition was the the last great victory of the reforming imp impulses of the 19th century. Going back to the mid-1800s, advocates of prohibition had been working state by state to regulate and ultimately prohibit the consumption and manufacture and distribution of alcohol. It was seen as a threat to domestic life. Having a drunkard husband threatened the income of the family, threatened the well-being and security of the family, led to wife beating and, and child abuse, and ultimately to prison and insanity and early death. And so an excessive alcohol consumption was seen as one of the great evils of American societies. But prohibition ran up against a major problem. It was an attempt to regulate social behavior, very accepted social behavior too. Although reformers were able to build up public opinion to prohibit alcohol on a national level by 1919, um, very quickly people began to see the problems of, of regulating or, or prohibiting a behavior that most Americans were willing to indulge. One of Spencer Penrose's greatest political roles was in advocating for the repeal of prohibition. He was appalled at the federal prohibition on the production and consumption of alcohol. The legend has it that he kept caches of, of alcohol in abandoned gold mines underneath the swimming pool of the Rodmore Hotel. In the Philadelphia Athletic Club, where he still had his old <laughs> uh, membership, uh, hides a lot of it in the basement of the Broadmoor. Every time they expand the Broadmoor Hotel, they run into a cache of booze. And if you go down to the Broadmoor today through the tavern, you'll see bottle after bottle lining the walls there in the Broadmoor, all of which has been drunk. In Spencer Penrose's library, he had bookshelves that would roll out from the walls and have stairways that go down into the basement. And the basement, supposedly, is where he kept all of his prohibition liquor. And so he would close the doors to the library, pull back the, the secret panels in the bookcases, and go downstairs and find the liquor that he had, had imported to Colorado and use that for his evening meetings. He was a very staunch advocate of the repeal of prohibition. To bring attention to it, here you had Spencer Penrose in the early 30s riding around in a little cart in downtown Colorado Springs with a sign on both sides of it opposed to prohibition being pulled by a llama. It was quite a spectacle and it was really inappropriate for Spencer Penrose to be riding around in this funny little buggy, but that was his point he was trying to make is that prohibition was bad for the people, it was bad for the hotel, and it was bad for business. Congress repealed prohibition in 1933 during the Roosevelt administration. You know, during the Great Depression, I think Spencer Penrose would agree, Americans really needed to drink.
One of the wonderful things uh, about uh, Spencer Penrose was the traditions he brought from uh, Philadelphia. Uh, the Cooking Club, which still exists, uh, is one that was a copy of a club in Philadelphia uh, where people who were active in civic and community activities got together periodically and fostered a climate, I think, that improved uh, the civic climate. Spencer Penrose had a very close relationship with many of the business leaders from Denver. Spencer Penrose created a men's dinner club called The Cooking Club up on the side of Shine Mountain below the Shine Mountain Zoo. It was made up of 20 members from Denver and 20 members from Colorado Springs. And they would come down here once a month for dinner and wine and cigars. And they weren't to discuss business, strictly for social. Mr. Penrose was now quite successful. So he started to turn his interest to other things. One of them being he's now an eligible bachelor in his mid-40s. Perhaps he should consider getting married. Well, there was a fine lady who had already gotten that idea before them. That was Julie Villiers McMillan, who was the daughter of the mayor of Detroit. And she had come out to Colorado Springs because her husband had contracted tuberculosis. And he ended up passing away. So Julie had her daughter, Gladys, and they uh, lived in Colorado Springs. They chose not to go back to Detroit. And very quickly, Julie started to pursue Spencer Penrose. But she was quite a lady, so she did it in a very formal and proper method. Uh, Mr. Penrose, being an eligible bachelor, was known for not having very good breakfasts, not having very good lunches, and consuming dinner with quite a lot of alcohol on occasion. And so he had the habits of a single guy. And so Julie had her cook come over to his house and on a regular basis make him his meals. And so she was very slowly getting to appreciate the finer things in life, which had never really been much of a priority of his. He was on a trip to Europe, and coincidentally, she was on the trip to Europe. And they say it was, it was strictly by accident, but I suspect they had planned it, but it was very proper back in that period. The other thing that was a big deal is Spencer had to get the approval from his parents to get married, even though they were very elderly. He was in his 40s. And while they had hoped he would marry a young, single, eligible woman, not a widower with a daughter, but Spencer Penrose did everything his very own way, and so uh, he married Julie Villiers McMillan. She kept him in line, and he had visions. He was a promoter. He tried to make sure that he was doing a lot of things for the first time, whether it's the road up Pikes Peak, whether it's the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, whether it's the Broadmoor Hotel. He loved people. He loved to be out there, but he had that governor on him. That was his wife, Julie. Julie Penrose saved Spencer Penrose. For all his sterling qualities, he was something of a rake, somebody who lived the high life and probably would have dissipated himself and probably would not have spent as much time uh, thinking about the good of, of people around him if not for the charitable instincts of his wife, Julie. Julie was very sweet, very soft, very feminine, and uh, I think controlled him very uh, effectively. Never any public disagreement or public uh, argument or whatnot. She appreciated the finer arts, symphony, opera, and I think he was still that single gentleman even though he was married for many years. Spencer and Julie Penrose had different personalities. I think uh, Spencer was very, was very focused, very driven. He knew where he wanted to go and he knew how he was going to get there. And if somebody blocked the way, he was going to find another way to, to achieve what he wanted to achieve. And Julie was probably more artistically concerned in, in the sense of the cultural amenities that were also important to a community based on her upbringing in Detroit. And so the two really, while Spencer may not have stopped to smell the roses quite as often, Julie reminded him that they were there. He built the shrine to Will Rogers on the top of Cheyenne Mountain, one of the really beloved American figures of the 1920s and 30s, and a close personal friend. But originally he built this great tower with a campanile and a bell tower up top and wonderful murals throughout it. It's a, a great monument, it's like 100 feet tall, towering over the Broadmoor and over Colorado Springs. It's on Cheyenne Mountain up above the zoo. He built that for himself. Julie Penrose says it looks kind of egotistical, don't you think? 
When Will Rogers dies in that plane crash with the Wally Post in Alaska, he had had Will Rogers there uh, to the Broadmoor, and I think he kind of idolized Will Rogers, who was everything Penrose wasn't. Penrose was a quiet, very conservative, secretive Republican. Will Rogers, of course, was the great humorist spokesperson who said, I'm not a member of any organized party, I'm a Democrat. So they were different in all kinds of ways, but I think they bonded, and so when he dies, they turned that into the monument to Will Rogers instead of the monument to Spencer Penrose. Will Rogers was humorous, philosopher, and friend to all mankind. He recognized the obligations of good citizenship and lived accordingly. I valued his friendship and life and revere his memory. The shrine of the sun on Cheyenne Mountain is my tribute to Will Rogers. A memorial designed to keep alive forever the inspiration of a great American. Julie put a lot of money into restoring the Central City Opera House, also bought up houses down there for the stars, for the, so you can get big name stars and whatnot to come to Central City because they're getting free housing and a cute little Victorian cottage way up high in the cool Rocky Mountain. Great escape from New York or Los Angeles for the summer. And uh, Julie we have largely to thank for much of the money that made the Central City Opera possible. The philanthropic spirit that lives on today in the Elpomar Foundation, uh, while we don't really have any records, I really think it started with Julie. But you have to understand, Spencer Penrose built the Broadmoor Hotel in 1918. He was still actively investing in mine interests. He was traveling all over the world. He still was a businessman, a promoter, and you know one of the best salesmen of the state of Colorado in the Pikes Peak region you could ever find. She used to actually go to the boys club and meet with the boys and to give them quarters and money, but support them and encourage them to improve their lives. I'm sure a lot of those boys that were attending the boys and girls club had parents that also probably worked for the Broadmoor or worked in the community and just could not afford any other way of daycare or support for their kids. So she was always a good supporter of youth through the boys clubs. Julie was a very staunch Catholic who, who believed strongly in the social gospel of, of, of taking your good fortune and spreading it to others through good works. And she used her good influences to shape Penrose's sense of philanthropy and put it to good ends. Without someone like Julie, we would remember him as one of the great robber barons of Colorado, perhaps. She was one of the founders of the uh, Car Springs Fine Arts Center. She was a great patron of the Central City Opera in Central City, Colorado. And if you look at the early grant recipients from Central City to Colorado College, the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, and the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, most of them were activities that Julie was very much interested in. She turned him from a playboy into a philanthropist by creating El Pomar Foundation which was the largest uh, foundation in Colorado until the, the uh, Bill Daniels Foundation started just a few years ago. And Del Pomar was wonderful because it devoted itself just to Colorado. Spencer Penrose left Philadelphia, never went back, ultimately came to Colorado Springs. Both Julie and Spencer adopted uh, Colorado Springs and the state of Colorado as their home. And for the benefit of all of us, they did that because their legacy continues to live on almost 80 years later. Spencer Penrose, the ultimate bon vivant, was not only a great drinker, but he, of course, fancied fine cigars. And probably the cigars that did him in, he dies of throat cancer in 1939. Julie passed away in 1956. So she outlives him uh, considerably. He actually had suffered bouts with cancer in 1931, and then it came back in 1937. I suspect that Spencer Penrose created El Pomer Foundation partly because he knew with the second bout of cancer that he needed to figure out what he wanted to do with his estate. He had no children. Uh, his wife, Julie McMillan Penrose, had one daughter, but had married a count in Luxembourg and so was no longer living here anymore. And so he had to figure out who he was going to leave his money to. He was the last surviving member of his generation. Uh, his other brothers had passed away prior to him. And he really had no connection to Philadelphia. So for the great benefit of the people of Colorado, he decided to leave his money to uh, El Pomar Foundation and uh, only gave make grants in the state of Colorado. Nothing went to Philadelphia. I really look at it as a gift, and it was the gift that Spencer and Julie Penrose left to the state of Colorado. Like so many 
Colorado millionaires, he found it within himself to, to take the fortune he made and give some of it back for the good of the people. His memorial service when he passed away in 1939 was actually up at the Will Rogers Shrine, which he had built in 1934 to honor Will Rogers, but it's really the burial place for Spencer and Julie Penrose. They were both cremated and buried up there. But instead of an elaborate service, he had his personal lawyer, a Denver lawyer named Henry McAllister, stand up in front of all the people after a carriage took his casket all the way up the Cheyenne Mountain Highway. And he stood up in front of all the people and read four lines from a poem by Tennyson entitled, Crossing the Bar. And he read these four lines. Life's race well run, life's work well done. Life's victory won, now cometh rest. And then the service was ended. Colorado Experience is a co-production of Rocky Mountain PBS and History Colorado. History Colorado brings history to life for audiences of all ages. Through exhibits, collections, and historic preservation programs throughout the state, History Colorado connects people to the stories, places, and heritage of Colorado's past that provide perspectives on today and inspire our choices for tomorrow. Find out more at www.historycolorado.org. Additional funding provided by El Pomar Foundation and the Betcher Foundation, celebrating 75 years of philanthropy in Colorado. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations. And from viewers like you, thank you. This episode is available on Blu-ray. Visit our website to order. There's more Colorado experience online at rmpbs.org slash Colorado experience.